Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go around and all the USL members are going to say their name, pronouns, affiliations, and then I will introduce our guest here. Okay. I'm Jackson Murphy, pronouns he, him, his. I'm a member of USL, president of South Bay High School, Kern Trans Club, and other things. I'm going to pass it off to Maggie. Thank you, Jackson. Uh, my name is Maggie Natris. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, my affiliations are with USL, uh, Social Justice Club, uh, and would be Climate Strike, uh, and also Queer and Trans Club at South of High School. I'm also on uh, the Climate Emergency Committee that is now part of the City of Langley, uh, the CCAC. And I'm going to pass it off to Naomi Atwood. Hi, my name is Naomi Atwood, and my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a part of USL and ASB at South Libby High School, and I'll pass it off to Sid. Hi, I'm Sid. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a part of USL and also run or co-run the art club at South Libby High School, and I'm somewhat affiliated with a few of the other clubs there, and I'll pass it off to... Shoot. I can't see who else is here that hasn't gone. I can pass it off for you. Um, Maddie? I'm Maddie. I use she, her pronouns. And my affiliations are with USL, South Woodby Social Justice Club, and Ecology Club, also at South Woodby. And I will pass it off to Audrey. Hi, I'm Audrey. I use she, her pronouns. I'm affiliated with the South Woodby Maldi United Nations Club. USL, and I'm also a student representative on the South of B School Board. Annie? Hi, my name's Annie. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am also affiliated with USL and South of B High School, but right now I am in Uruguay as an exchange student. Um, so just here to appreciate the webinar. And I'll pass it off to whoever has not gone, Derek, I haven't heard from you, but I don't know if there's more students. Hi, my name is Derek Koshiko. I use he, him pronouns. So excited to be here. Thank you. I'm with USL, E3 Washington, um, South Libby Schools Foundation, Climate Crisis Action Committee, uh, and Solidarity Over Supremacy. Thank you, Derek. And it's, I'm so happy to introduce uh, Nick, uh, our Thanks. amazing guest. Um, and if you would like to introduce yourself. Hey everyone, um, what's up? I'm Nick Masankai. I'm really excited to be here as a guest speaker uh, for this queer and trans discrimination webinar with USL. And um, yeah, I'm a Seattle uh, cultural worker in music, poetry, multimedia, and transformation. So this is just webinar protocol, a little different than our normal meetings. Camera on, um, at least for a little bit at the beginning, so we can make sure you are a person. Please keep your mic muted to uh, limit background noise, um, unless you're a presenter, obviously, and speaking. Please keep your name and pronouns in your Zoom name. I think most people have already done that. And just a protocol, if there's a disturbance, just turn your camera off. Um, and if you need to leave the meeting, you can to please totally do that. We will check up on you afterwards. Um, we will just try to take care of if anything happens as, as soon as possible. Um, I don't foresee that happening. So most people know who we are, but just for those of you who may be a little less familiar. We're a student-led and organized group. Um, we're focused on a, ra a range of social justice issues and fighting the climate crisis. And we started two and a half years ago now. And we've done so much since then. Most of it, all of you know, um, including the series of webinars, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Okay. So the first webinar series that we did last summer um, is the Patriarchy webinar series, um, and those are all on YouTube. And then the series, the discrimination webinar series, first one was interdiscrimination, second was racial and ethnic discrimination, and this is obviously queer and trans discrimination webinar. Um, and the first webinar in the series, interdiscrimination is on YouTube. And the climate crisis webinar series is something we're planning for later this year. Thank you everyone for being here, and I hope you come to all the rest. Why are we doing this series? We're doing this ser webinar series to spread awareness about what discrimination is and how it affects our society and culture every day. Um, and we hope these webinars will help our community be aware of discrimination and the ways to dismantle systemic discrimination. So we do wanna have a trigger warning um, for those who are part of the current trans community. We are gonna be talking about topics that will probably be difficult for you. 
Um, and please feel free to leave the meeting or just turn your camera off of yourself um, if you feel triggered um, and you need to take a breather. Um, and we, and also we want to make this a space that you can feel comfortable and everything. Okay. This is our privilege check. Um, many in this space are cisgender and and straight or heterosexual. And so we would like you to please check your privilege um, in these topics and in this space to make this a space that is completely a safe space for the queer and trans community and to talk about these topics before you comment or ask questions, make sure you don't let your internal biases, if they're there, which um, affect what you're saying and not be hurtful. So thank you. And now we can go to the next one. Okay, so we just wanted to get this out of the way early and make sure there's no questions before we move on to more complex issues. Um, the definition of LGBTQI plus and I, LGBTQI plus. Is, yeah. So the first term is lesbian, um, non-men who love non-men. And it, it is not women who love women because um, it is inclusive of non-binary people and people of other genders. So yeah, and the same is true for gay, which is non-women who love non-women. Um, and the lesbian flag is in the top left corner and the gay flag is in the top right corner. And then bisexual is attraction to more than one gender. Um, and that is in the bottom left corner. Um, and transgender is an umbrella term for differing gender than assigned at birth. Um, and this we will go into more in, later in the webinar. And that is the flag um, right to the right of the bisexual flag. Um, the next term is queer, and this is an umbrella term for a differing, a non-heteronormative attraction. So, yeah, and that is the flag that is right next to the transgender flag. And yeah, the intersex, if intersex person um, is a person who's born with a combination of male and female biolog biological traits. Um, and this is um, actually a really common thing in our society. And their flag is right next to the queer flag. The next term is asexual, and that is learn no sexual attraction. And there are many different types of asexuality. It's a spectrum. And that flag is right next to their sex flag. Um, and then the plus is just other sexual orientations or genders and gender identities that are not uh, earlier in the acronym. If you are curious about any specific term that I have not gone over, you can Google it. All of the information is out there, and we will also define a lot of them later in this webinar. Um, and the flag that is right next to the asexual flag um, is the progressive pride flag and the flag of the LGBTQI plus community. Are there any questions about what that last slide, just so we have no, um, no wonderings moving forward? And you can either put them in the chat or raise your hand if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and I will pass it off to Nick. Thank you so much, Jackson. Um, I feel so refreshed in these, um, these terms and definitions, even if I'm queer and trans myself. <laughs> so thank you for a really comprehensive list. And yeah, so I just wanted to, um, uh, throughout this uh, webinar, I'm gonna be sharing a couple poems that um, illustrate exactly kind of why we're here and what we're talking about. Um, you know, there are a lot of facts and definitions and statistics and things like that. So I'm here to deliver kind of the artsy side to, to just illustrate what this all means and why we're here. So yeah, this first poem is called Love is Just as Possible. It's a gorgeous night to fall in love. It's a perfect moment to redefine love. It's a memory laid to rest and reborn, loving you. It's the soil of my body caring for my people. The walls unfurl, asking why I'd ever need to fall in love when everything I dreamt is here. My muscular heart, strong enough to hold what can never be defined. 
the light seeping through cracks in my armor. Slits epiphanies where we can trust again. We can have it all. Under the pink petaled bushes, against the silver neighborhood fence, heat of our laughter and the chilly start of spring, south side of the house I'm renting, home in the family I'm building, dreams that only arise when you let me listen, new children in the arms of inner children. I transfigure wind into song for my voice to embrace you. On this gorgeous night, love is just as possible. Thanks y'all so much. Um, if y'all have any um, feedback or feelings that you wanna share um, after I read any of these poems, I'm not gonna expect like applause or anything cause we're in like a webinar, but yeah, thank you so much, Julie. Yeah, so if you wanna comment or anything, go ahead and put it in the chat and we can like shout it out or whatever if there are any questions and stuff. But yeah, let's continue on with the presentation. Thank you so much, Nick. That's so amazing. Um, I'm so excited to have you here this again. Okay, I'm gonna move on as those reactions keep coming in. So I just wanted to go over um, some current events around the LGBTQ plus discrimination and because I thought they were really impactful. So this first one is just a world map of the protection and criminalization of LGBTQ plus people. And I thought this was really impactful, at least for me, um, to see how few countries have constitutional protection for LGBTQ plus people, um, and also how many have way harsher punishments for being LGBTQ plus. And something that I noticed in my research around this um, is that, as you can see on the map, much of Africa ha is criminal is has criminalized being LGBTQ plus. Um, and I, in research around this, um, I have found that this is, in part, most it's it is mostly because of colonization. Um, and something that I noticed is, or something that I found is that although thirty three percent. Uh, only 3%, 33% of countries in the world are part of the British Commonwealth, meaning that they were colonized by Britain, but they make up 50% of the countries that criminalize being LGBTQ+, which is pretty terrible. Um, and I also found that many cultures in Africa, um, specifically, I found one in Uganda, um, that were very open to um, being LGBTQ+, um, and had uh, non-binary uh, people or something, people that we would define as non-binary in their culture um, and same-sex marriages and things like that. So I thought that was really interesting. If you didn't see in the first one, uh, in the first map, the U.S. is defined as partial protection. Um, and the next two slides kind of explain that. Um, so this is conversion therapy is therapy that, or it's kind of, it's forcing queer and trans youth <laughs> trying to force queer and trans youth into being, um, forcing them into a heteronormative society and in gender roles and just trying to keep them the way society wants them to be. <laughs> um, and it doesn't work. And it is only banned in 18 states and five states in one territory have restricted it, um, but not, ban not banned it. Um, and the judicial circuit of Alabama, Georgia and Florida have laws, laws banning the enforcement of laws banning conversion therapy, um, even though none exist in their states, in those states right now, which is pretty unbelievable and just crazy. Next map, please. Okay, so this panic defense laws um, are laws that imply or state that violence against the LGB LGBTQI plus community is acceptable or understandable under certain conditions. And only 16 states have banned these laws um, as shown on the map, which is just, it's just, it's just, 
it's just like, I can't even like wrap my head around it. Although these laws aren't um, used um, that much, they still are in place in all of these states, um, which is just terrible. Um, and recently they disproportionately have been affecting um, black trans women um, because of the intersectionality of their identities. I think we can move to our next slide. Um, thank you again, Jackson. Um, I think those graphics are really um, visually illuminating of um, this discrimination just like still constantly happening um, culturally, institutionally, politically, et cetera. So thank you. Um, and that is kind of what um, this next poem is about. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, I can't escape the uneasiness of where we are. There's a constant emergency in the back of my mind. It's a city, so there's always a siren. If I numb, the violence continues. If I feel, they call me crazy. Are we connecting or are you attaching? Do you hear me or are you projecting? It's so bad in newer ways now. And still, they give me the same command, grow up. I hear elders talk about what used to work. I watch young people distracted by learning more than they should have to. My friends and I are caught in the middle, making monumental moves in an uncertain society. I hate when you say youth are, to, are the future. How can you ignore what we're putting them through right now? And still they shine brilliant. My generation made it okay to be sad. My generation said, stop, or you'll get us more sick. All of us now suffer pandemic. I don't miss my childhood in an age of social constructs. I still, I still feel held hostage by the ideal myth of how things were. If you cared about the kids, would you keep mishandling change like this? I'm almost 30. All my life, I've just been begging for anyone to listen. I've learned the power of my own voice, how it's the echoes of my lineage. I'm everything they accomplished. The forest burns, but the soil knows reincarnation. Trillionaires blast greedy rockets, but our people fashion dust into galaxy. I can still slip you kind words from my side of my double mask. Disastrous times and the people to blame are calling the shots and we continue onward. If you can't hope right now, you're choosing not to listen. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, and yeah, again, if anyone has any feedback, uh, feel free to put it in the chat. I also believe that we are uh, going into a uh, one minute reflection after this. Um, so if everyone just wants to finish putting in those uh, last comments um, and last bits of feedback, that would be amazing. Um, and then everyone, if we could just turn off our cameras and really just sit with this poem and also with the uh, facts that Jackson just shared earlier. Alrighty, as we come back, um, I would greatly appreciate it if everyone um, could turn their cameras back on. It's great for us presenters, especially so that we can see reactions and things like that. But I'm going to give a couple seconds um, just so that everyone can come back um, and then we will continue on with our presentation. Thank you all. All right. Hi, everyone. Now I'm going to be going over four different types of homophobia that are often seen in our society. The first being personal or internalized homophobia. This is prejudice based on a personal belief that gay, lesbian, and bisexual people are sinful, immoral, sick, inferior, or incomplete. This personal homophobia is experienced as feelings of fear, discomfort, dislike, hatred, or disgust with same-sex sexuality. Um, when this happens with LGBTQ people, it is called internalized homophobia. 
LGBTQ youth are often taught that same-sex sexuality is inferior and many internalize this to the point where self-acceptance is difficult and that's when the internalized homophobia is often presented. Um, next is the interpersonal homophobia, which is individual behavior based on personal homophobia. This is often expressed by name calling, telling jokes, verbal and physical harassment, and other individual acts of discrimination. Um, most people show homophobia in nonviolent, more commonplace ways. Some examples of this would be relatives shunning their queer trans family members, coworkers being distant or cold to those types of colleagues, or people using the word gay as a synonym for bad and stupid. The next thing will be the institutional homophobia, which refers to the, the many ways in which government, businesses, churches, and other institutions and organizations discriminate against people on the basis of sexual orientation. Some examples of this would be religious organizations with anti-LGBTQIA plus policies and sermons, agencies refusing to provide resources and services to queer and trans people, governments which fail to ensure the rights of citizens regardless of sexual orientation, and as uh, Jackson showed in the graphic earlier, many countries still criminalizing homophobia. And then uh, the fourth time I'll go over right now is cultural homophobia, which refers to social standards and norms which dictate that being heterosexual is better or more moral than being queer and trans and that everyone is or should be heterosexual and cisgender. Um, an example of this would be in TV and movies, how it mainly shows heterosexual and cisgendered characters. And then often when LGBTQ characters are portrayed, they're unhappy or overly stereotyped. Go back to Nick. Thanks, Sid. All this information is making me so refreshed in like <laughs> my own like culture and everything. So thank you. Um, thanks, y'all. Um, yeah. yeah, so this um, next short poem, a uh, short story I'm going to read is um, um, kind of explaining in um, my childhood how cultural and institutional homophobia uh, affected me and had become a trauma because I still think about that today. Um, so yeah, this is Impossible Wedding. Impossible wedding in a young brown girl's head. She once aspired to golden bands on ring fingers. Her secret lover knotted a hand-woven friendship bracelet round her wrist before dance class. Her first love was also Filipino. So they practiced pronouncing mahalkita over middle school phone calls to each other's landlines. I love you. Hi, Mrs. Masangkai, this is A. Can I please talk to Nicole? Good evening, Mr. H, may I please speak to A? This is Nicole. Soon we didn't need the home phones. We got our first cell phones in 2004, whispering middle school secrets and dreams only for night ghosts, not suspecting parents. She wanted enough money one day so to, to support all her loved ones. She wanted it so bad, she cried to me as I listened with adoration. I would tell her she's beautiful with gorgeous aspirations that would without a doubt come true. Through tears, she'd say, I'm the closest person to good, just because I listened to things she told nobody else. In the mornings after, young closeted girl flees the wedding in her head. No acknowledgement of first love. It's convenient to play dumb. World scoffs at the revolution of girls of color in love young girls policed for something pure as this. She taught me love and I taught her silence. She's alone at the altar in her head. I never showed up to her white gown. I never lifted the veil, which one of us really hid behind veils. Before my family moved across the country, I finally told her that I loved her backstage before our last dance recital together. That was our last moment alone. That was the last in-person truth I offered. I squandered the love of my life. Whether marriage or fantastical lie, everyone else got access. I just wanted the impossible in vain for us. 
it's always a mistake to fight for a cause alone. A friendship bracelet falls off a brown girl's wrist. It grants one wish to come true. I hope she found a love better than mine. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much again, Nick. That's really powerful. And thank you for sharing all of your amazing poems and the personal labor that it, that takes. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me here. Um, you know, as we, um, I'm down to take questions about that poem and our short story. And um, if you, uh, in kind of molding your questions, if you have them, kind of think about how I'm talking about, again, it's institutional and um, cultural homophobia. And the specific institution I'm talking about is the institution of marriage. Um, so yeah, if y'all have any questions about um, uh, institutional homophobia, cultural homophobia in, or just nice words, that's very nice. Thank you all. <laughs> but yeah, let me know. Oh, okay. Y'all are just very sweet. So let's just, <laughs> let's just keep moving. We can keep moving on, I think. Okay. Also, before we do move on, if anyone had any questions about the slides that came before this, um, this is also the time to uh, ask questions now. Um, but yeah, I can also start if everyone's good on their end. All right. Um, so we're just going to go over um, types of homophobia just in a bit more, I guess, broken down way. So give me one second and then I will jump into this. So there are multiple different types of homophobia. Um, some are more severe than others, um, but they all do have impacts and they all can be categorized under homophobia in general. So unintentional homophobia um, is someone who was, say, exposed to queer relationships um, or uh, knew someone in their life that was queer but didn't really fully dive into uh, working with their own internalized homophobia, or they're just going off of stereotypes that they know um, or assumptions that they've made. Honestly, uh, this is the most common type. And if this person or any people who uh, fall into unintentional homophobia uh, wish to be educated, they can be. Um, but as soon as they avoid that education, um, then it falls back under uh, intentional homophobia. It could also be someone trying to speak out on a topic, uh, but they don't understand fully uh, what they're talking about, or they just um, misunderstand and misstate. Um, and this is under the messing up category that I'll go over later. And then there's intentional homophobia. So this is people against queer uh, individuals, um, trans individuals. They don't think that uh, queer people should belong in public um, or should be allowed at all. Uh, they say very derogatory things um, and may think that queer people don't need equal rights or opinions. They don't like it when queer people are seen in the media. media. They think that uh, queer people are shoving it down their throats um, and prefer people um, to stay away from them if they identify as queer. And then there's outright malicious homophobia, which is open aggression towards queer people. Um, they go out of their way to put down um, gay people, scream it from the rooftops, um, may or may not threaten or harass them, but use incendiary uh, language such as slurs or um, anti-queer ideas or ideals to show queer people exactly how they feel about them. And again, I'm going to go under uh, messing up. Uh, just take note that some of these uh, have different various uh, severities, again, but they all do fall under homophobia. So there's messing up. Um, key point here is that you have good intentions, um, but you end up being homophobic. Just different intentions causes an entire different thing to happen. Um, it to not be labeled as messing up, um, but it's still, again, homophobia. And um, there's also standing by. Um, so see homophobia happening and don't stand up or challenge it. Now this one has quite a few caveats to it. Um, not everyone has the presence of mind to speak up in the moment, um, especially if they're taken by surprise. And not everyone has the emotional energy to address homophobia every time they see it, especially if they're queer and actively hurt by it. Um, and not every queer person is required or should have to be an activist, um, especially if it's just their identity um, in the first place. So standing by does fall under homophobia, but of course there are some cases when it's just not safe to actually speak out against it. 
Um, and yeah, just take these to heart as we continue on um, with this presentation. Sid, I think I'm handing it back to you. All right, thanks, Maggie. So one of the main causes of homophobia is the spread of misinformation and myths. Many people are taught from a young age that heterosexuality is what is considered normal and any other identity is wrong. But LGBTQIA plus people have existed throughout the world for all of history. In order to make more queer identities um, accepted and normalized, we must continue to spread accurate information and educate people on this community and the discrimination they face. Um, we encourage you to take the information you're learning today and share it with others to help, or prom help promote a more accepting environment. And we can move on. Um, some other discrimination terms that you might hear and be less familiar with. Um, obviously, we we've been discussing homophobia, which would be the dislike or fear of gay people. And then biphobia is the dislike or fear of bisexual people. And then aphobia and acephobia is the same thing, but applied to people identifying as asexual. Aerophobia is the same thing, but specifically with people who identify as aromantic and transphobia is with people who are transgender. Um, so that just breaks down some of the other terms and what sexualities and identities they correlate with. And then next slide. Um, I'll be going over a few different common misconceptions that people frequently say uh, and why they are not true. The first being that being queer is a choice. Sexual orientation is being seen to be influenced by a mixture of genetic and environmental factors and is not something anyone can control. Reparative or sexual reorientation therapy has been rejected by all the established and reputable American medical, psychological, psychiatric, and professional counseling organizations. Um, conversion therapy is harmful and ineffective, but as we saw in the maps earlier, it's still used in many places. Another misconception is that you can be too young or too old to be figuring out sexual sexuality and gender identity. Um, many LGBTQIA people know that they're attracted to members of their own sex at an early age. Others learn much later in life. There's no specific age that these things happen at. You can go on. Another common misconception is that being around LGBTQIA plus people or having access to information on homosexuality endangers the well-being of children. Learning about or spending time with people who are LGBTQIA plus does not influence the sexual orientation or gender identity of minors, nor does it harm their well-being. Um, and the last common misconception I'll go over is that LGBTQIA plus people are dangerous to children, and there's no link whatsoever between um, these identities and child abuse. Evidence shows that LGBTQIA plus people all over the world, just like straight and cisgender people, are good parents, teachers, and role models for young children. So if you hear any of those misconceptions, they are definitely not true. And we can move on. Thank you, Sid. Um, I think it's, um, uh, well, this next poem is kind of illustrating, um, I think, one of the root things for um, so much homophobia and so much um, misconception um, about queer and trans people is um, a lack of projecting a lack of love for self <laughs> um, from um, cis folks, from uh, straight folks. Um, and because they see, um, like all the presenters here are, um, I think, queer and trans. And um, I think, um, it's not just up to us to um, love ourselves. It's also, we have to love each other. Um, I think that's what social change is for. Love is social. Um, so yeah, that's what this next poem is about. If you are to be in my life, you will love yourself. And with me, you will celebrate my love from my own self. And then, and only then will I get to love you. It is legitimate not to, but I am done bearing the casualties of self-pity turned violent. So if that's where you are, turn around right now. My power is seeing yours. And if you deny your own force 
there's nothing else I can do but protect myself and move forward. I have always known someone else's hands on my body because they chose not to remember they had their own. But now it is my time because it is also your time. And if you think you can steal that triumph from me, bring me back down to the underbelly of wound again. After all the tooth and nail, I scraped bone dry bleeding to birth myself into a truer form. I did not crawl through violation and sweat, journeyed on hands and knees to be mocked by your own fear of yourself. Only if you confront the doubt of who you are before change, and it need not be perfect or brash or strong today, I have seen so many discover in the quiet curl of caving into oneself weeping, and then the next day a beaming struggle, not conquered, but at peace. It looks so different for everyone I meet and get to cherish on whatever level. Each confrontation of personal fear is as unique as a face. When you can square yours to the mirror or the past or the dream or just me, I can tell you are ready for me to hold you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Nick. And we're going to go real quickly um, into questions again for this section, um, specifically ending now homophobia. Um, and I think that was a great uh, way to wrap that up um, and translate into uh, this kind of next section going into transphobia. Um, so thank you so much for sharing out. And I do think that we have a couple questions that were uh, posed in the comments. Um, so I'm going to look into those right now. And then if you have more, uh, please, please feel free to ask. Um, and again, we're ending uh, the section specifically on homophobia. So if you have uh, questions that are tied to that, uh, now would be the time to ask. Um, alrighty, so for all of the presenters here or anyone um, of the youth members here who want to answer, there was a question wondering about the use of the word uh, gay as a broad broad term overall. So you don't hear lesbian used as much, um, but instead uh, the gay community, for example. So can somebody speak to uh, why that's used in general? Jackson, go ahead. Um, honestly, I'm not sure why um, lesbian is used less than gay. Um, my assumption is it, it could be a connection to patriarchy and centering the male figures in the in the community, um, that could be a possibility. Um, I think that if you are looking to describe um, the, the if, if you mean by saying the gay community as people who are not straight, I think saying queer, the queer community would be a better descriptor, um, but that's just me. <laughs> I can definitely see your point, Jackson. Um, I also don't necessarily think we uh, think about that enough, um, about why that's used as the general term. Again, queer is the umbrella term, but it was also reclaimed um, and fairly recently um, by the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, originally it was used um, in a derogatory way. So um, it's really easy to, um, now use it, um, but it was probably a lot harder to sum up the queer community as queer when you know you don't really want to be called queer because people are calling you queer in a derogatory way. So that's something to think about. Um, I I don't know, uh, Nick, if you want to add in, say it. go ahead. Yeah, uh, if you guys haven't seen the chat, that is another good point that uh, Victoria Bell brought up. That one reason could be because it's um, only one syllable, and so faster to say gay than lesbian. Um, so on top of the other possible causes, that's one thing that may be contributing to that use more. But definitely um, now that queer has been reclaimed, that is a much more inclusive term to describe the community. Um, I think the last thing I'll add to that I, is just echoing what everyone else said. Um, and um, 
the thing I would add is that um, I think it's not, um, it's almost recategorizing um, certain identities that are just different from the norm when it comes to gender and sexuality can kind of be like, we have a lot of letters already. It's a lot of um, the LGBTQIA plus, right? There's already a plus. Um, and I think, yeah, gay community can be sometimes an easier thing to say, but I think um, it's more, um, perhaps we can go beyond um, uh, naming folks that are in the margins and rather have those marginalized values um, be kind of a new paradigm of like how we could think about love and gender and sexuality for everyone. Um, so it's um, not kind of like tokenizing a community, um, things like that. So yeah, there's that too. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Nick. Um, someone else put in the comments, uh, I was wondering if we could touch on homophobia inside uh, members of the community. Um, example of queer people being uh, lesbophobic, homophobic, biphobic, etc., even when they're proud of their identity. Um, I think this is definitely an important topic to touch on. Um, and I also know that, Sid, you touched on this a little bit. Um, so if you'd like to elaborate, you're welcome to. Um, I can also take a stab. Up to you. Yeah, um, I'm sure you guys can say more on to it. But um, like I said previously, that like, um, interpersonal homophobia can be seen uh, by members of the LGBTQIS IA plus community often when they're projecting um, their own self-hatred from, uh, or I didn't mean interpersonal, I meant internalized homophobia, but um, it can be projected as interpersonal when they're uh, at the point where self-acceptance is difficult and not accepting themselves makes it harder to accept others in the community as well. Um, so that's often a cause of uh, homophobia inside the community. Um, and I'm not sure who else wants to speak to that. Um, I can as well. Um, and just for everyone who's putting questions in the chat, uh, feel free to keep on adding those. Um, we might have a couple people answer them in the chat, um, but we are gonna have to wrap up pretty soon just to keep on going. Um, but yeah, I think um, it is, it is definitely part of internalized homophobia. It is that internalized stigma of like, oh, being gay or being queer is not um, the norm, it's not right, things like that. Um, but I also know that, uh, for example, biphobia um, is specifically around uh, queer people feeling that uh, people who are bi are not queer enough. Um, so say um, a woman who identifies as bi uh, is dating a man, um, she's then told that she's faking it. Uh, she's not actually bi, uh, she's actually straight and just trying to get attention, things like that. That's all forms uh, of homophobia within the own, our own community. Um, and that sort of a thing, uh, the targeting of uh, people within our own community um, can be really detrimental because it doesn't actually help anyone. <laughs> it ends up breaking us apart. It ends up singling out um, specific identities. It ends up singling out people um, who are part of all of these various things that are listed. Um, and we don't actually end up growing stronger um, or working with each other or supporting each other or having a community that we can fall back on um, despite the fact <laughs> that we're already uh, targeted by people outside our community as well. So just something to think about um, overall. Anything to add to that before we move on? Okay, great. And I do see uh, at least I believe Vivian and Gary, uh, we're gonna get to your questions. Um, so what Vivian asked, what can I uh, or other cis humans do to support those who are experiencing homophobia? Uh, what is the best way to understand and keep up with information presented? LGBTQIA plus, the letters keep getting longer. Uh, some are new to me, so I'm sure others in the board, broader community are not uh, tuned in as much as others who are supportive of learning more and standing uh, witness as we stand by. Um, does someone want to tackle that? Um, I can speak to that a bit. Um, what I personally believe is the best way to support and combat homophobia, first of all, is educating yourself and um, spreading accurate information. Gratefully, 
the internet has a lot of um, accurate resources on these topics and so being able to recognize uh, where good information is presented and then the other thing uh, is standing up when you see homophobia when you hear people saying misconceptions um, just definitely uh, speaking up and standing up when homophobia is presented around you and not sitting in silence uh, as these um, misinformation and uh, discrimination continues. I think that that is extremely important. Um, I'm not sure if any of you guys want to add to that. I think Nick wanted to. Well, thanks, Maggie. Uh, thank you, Sid. Um, yeah, I would just say also, um, I might my answer might be a little more woo-woo, but um, I think even if you don't, I, I think we all as humans have a gut feeling of when something violent is happening um, to someone, even if you can't pull up the right vocabulary word in the moment of like, oh, that is definitely cis heteronormative, blah, 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 happening right now. And I need to do X, Y, Z. Like, if you know, you know, all of these oppressions that we're talking about, we this is the last discrimination webinar out of three. And those, and you could go on and on, right? But what it comes down to is that all oppression is connected. So if you see violence happening to someone because for whatever reason, um, then it's important to uh, do something about it. Um, so I even think beyond go going beyond um, educating yourself on specific terms, because yeah, there will be terms that just keep adding on and on. What the root of it is, um, and that's what a lot of like radical activism is, that's what radical means, it's root, um, is that we have to um, love each other in public. And I forgot who said that. That is a quote by someone, and I will put it in the chat once I look it up, because um, I don't want to steal that. But uh, justice looks like what love looks like in public, um, or justice is what love looks like in public. Um, that's what it comes down to, even if you can't get all the vocabulary words down and everything. Um, just be respectful and love yourself so that you can love others too, and vice versa. I would like to add just a little bit on, um, and thank you, Nick, for sharing that. I think that's the root of it. <laughs> um, I, I, th I think one thing um, that you can do because you're if you if you aren't going to go out and learn, you don't have to go out and learn every single term out there, um, and the intricacies of every single identity. But if someone tells you something, like if they if they tell you their identity and how they they either like they want you to address them or how they are, believe them and do not question them, even if it's something you haven't heard. And do not, and if you need, if you want clarification, you can look it up. Google's amazing. But don't don't like grill them on their identity and who they are in the moment. Just be like, cool, and go, move on. It's not it's not a hard thing. <laughs> The other thing is uh, don't rely on queer people to then give you all the information on their sexuality. Like they don't have to explain to you or come out to you. Um, it's, it's part of who they are and they're um, definitely able to do that if they feel comfortable, but that's not uh, your decision to make. So yeah, no, completely echoing what you said, uh, Jackson. And thank you, Nick, too, as well for your um, input there. Um, I do think that we had one more question, um, specifically Gary asking about, um, how about the rainbow? Um, I don't necessarily know what you're talking about, but if anyone wants to take a stab at this, uh, you're welcome to, or uh, Gary, if you can clarify in the comments, that'd be great. I, he was, I think, I believe he was talking about, when we were talking about um, the phrase gay community um, and uh, as a replacement for that, um, for just like the queer and trans community. Um, just thinking about rebranding ideas. I think we mentioned love people. That's a little the hippies are that, 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 that also. Kind of, um, but Rainbow Coalition, you know, from that generation. Um, if if you don't like uh, what you're called, uh, rebrand re yourself. Yeah, I also think just because we are everywhere um, and spread across the world, it is a little hard to rebrand. <laughs> um, and um, 
I think so. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> hey, is it okay if I add to that? Yeah. Yeah. Cool, cool, thanks. Um, so the thing is, um, there is a balance, right? So yes, I did just give a woo-woo. Yeah, love is this, and um, the root of it is love, blah, 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 blah. But the thing is, um, love is so depoliticized, the way we talk about it, but unfortunately, it is actually a very politicized um, uh, we, a thing to do. We have um, all these um, oppressions happening, not only socially, but politically too. And that's why there is certain language and there is certain history that has built up over time, um, changing throughout time, becoming new, um, coming from even pre-colonial concepts. Um, and it's not, um, and it's unfortunately not as simple as rebranding. It's actually, there's so much history and so much um, navigating language. I mean, everyday language changes. Um, so it's it's so much more complicated than just saying, oh, I can rebrand myself if I don't like being called this or something. Um, there is a power and a political strategy to naming what you experience. And you have to use the language that you have in the society you live in to be able to actually voice that. So it's, it's really, um, it's it's a balance and it's complicated. Um, so that is um, kind of one thing I wanted to add to that idea of um, rebranding and you know ideas of you know what we could use. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, we still use the rainbow flag um, to represent the entirety of the LGBTQI plus community. So there are certain ways to envelop that, but um, it's incredibly important uh, to continue to follow what you're saying, Nick, to have that kind of self-love and that uh, kind of identity and that support within the community and also beyond. Um, but it isn't as, compl it isn't as, I guess, straightforward as just rebranding, as you said. Um, Christina, uh, said a couple things in the chat as well if people want to look there and then I think there was one other question um, yeah I want to quickly bring up um sorry if I no you're fine you, but there's another question I'm sorry if I butcher your name but I believe it's uh Jezen, something like that um my apologies uh you're asking about um using how using the term sexual orientation can be tricky when discussing with young children, um, especially in elementary school because of the word sexual. Um, but some students as young as fourth grade are already talking about their identity. So you're looking for age appropriate resources that are used to teach. Um, I know there's definitely plenty online uh, websites such as the Trevor Project, I believe have different resources on education. Um, and even with just a quick Google search, I've found um, several different articles uh, that talks about supporting LGBTQ students in elementary school. Um, so I think there definitely are age appropriate resources out there um, from people who have studied more into that. I'm not sure if any of you guys uh, know any specific web sorts, websites or resources that are good for that. Um, if so, people could put that in the chat, chat or anything, but um, yeah, I think we need to move on pretty quick now, um, but there should be spots for questions further in the webinar. Perfect, thank you. Um, alrighty, so here are a few definitions of gender identities. So uh, just know that this is not a comprehensive list. Um, this is just some of the more common ones. And of course, doing more uh, research and educating yourselves on these topics um, and these identities is incredibly important. Um, and I'll explain why <laughs> very briefly, um, but yeah. First uh, identity that we have up here is transgender. Um, as Jackson went over before, it's an umbrella term uh, for people whose gender identity uh, differs from their sex at, that they were assigned at birth. Cisgender is the opposite of transgender, so same gender identity as was assigned at birth. Um, so if you are um, assigned female at birth and you identify as female, you are cis. If you are assigned female birth and you identify as any other gender except for female, um, then you are transgender. And then we have the non-binary umbrella, um, non-binary and gender queer umbrella, um, which is basically any gender identity or gender expression outside of the categories of man and woman. Um, and that is just 
pretty straightforward. Um, and also I wanna emphasize that man and woman um, are the binary genders and there are quite a few beyond that um, that are important to note. And I'll go into a few of those now. So for example, we have demi boy and demi girl. Um, so a demi boy is someone who partially identifies as a man um, or as a boy, um, but it doesn't fully identify with that label. Um, and someone who's a demi girl is someone who partially identifies as a woman or a girl. Um, and a demi boy could be someone who is assigned uh, female at birth, but uh, identifies as a demi boy, um, or uh, they could also be assigned male at birth um, and identify as a demi boy. Um, and we'll go into that a little bit more later on as well. And there's agender. So agender is, first of all, not a gender because it literally means a person without gender. Um, it is simply a trying to conceptualize uh, what these people experience, um, but it's pretty straightforward. They just don't identify uh, with a gender. They do not have a gender. Um, then we have bi-gender, uh, so someone who has two gender identities, um, either simultaneously um, or varying between the two. Um, that could be someone who identifies as both male and female, or it could be someone who identifies as male and some form of gender queer. Um, there are a lot of fluctuations uh, in that term. Then there's also gender fluid. Um, so this is someone whose gender varies over time. Um, it could be really quickly. Um, it could be over months. It could be over years. Um, but basically someone whose uh, gender changes. Um, and just to note, um, people who are gender fluid and all of the people on this list um, do not owe anyone uh, their identity. They don't need to alert you to the fact that they are part of this identity, but it is important for you to respect what they identify as. Um, and we'll go into that as we continue on uh, to the next slide. Alrighty, so just to help conceptualize uh, what it's meant by the transgender uh, umbrella here, we have binary and non-binary under that umbrella. So a trans man uh, could be uh, binary, so assigned female at birth, um, identifies as male, they're under the binary uh, umbrella. Non-binary is genderqueer, demi-boy, demi-girl, uh, gender fluid, bi-gender. Again, any uh, gender identity that is outside of just male and female. Um, so real quick, I just want to go over sexuality versus sex uh, versus gender identity uh, versus gender expression. So this is kind of something we've already gone over. Um, part of these will call back to other things you've seen on other slides, uh, especially what Jackson has told you all. Um, but basically sexuality is who you're attracted to. Um, you're attracted to someone. Uh, sex is your biological sex um, assigned due to your chromosomes, genitalia, what you were assigned at birth. Um, and that could be male, female, um, and intersex. Um, and that is what sex is. And you can see some versions um, of chromosomes right after that. Then we have gender, which is a social construct meant to categorize, yeah, categorize the social behaviors into separate identities uh, and provide them with uh, predetermined roles, so gender roles. So if someone identifies um, their gender as a woman, for example, there are certain roles, gender roles, especially in specific societies that go along with uh, what it means to be a woman. And then there's gender expression. So that's how an individual uh, presents themselves to the outside world in relation to how society perceives gender in general. So someone could be uh, wearing a dress or wearing a skirt, and that is usually tied to um, someone being a woman or a girl or femininity um, and that gender construct. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that person identifies as a girl or is a girl. Um, and I'll go into that more in the next slide. Thank you. Um, so identity and expression are completely separate. Um, that means, like I said, <laughs> gender identity is uh, someone's internal um, and deeply held sense of their gender, while their expression is external man manifestations of that gender. So it could be their name, their pronouns, uh, their clothing, their haircut, uh, behavior, voice, body characteristics, etc. cetera. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, someone who identifies with a specific gender has to fall into specific gender roles. So for example, non-binary people don't owe anyone androgyny and it isn't uh, anyone's place to question that. Um, you don't have to uh, 
look androgynous or dress androgynous in order to be a non-binary human being. Um, and we should always be calling people their preferred pronouns despite how they might look. Um, I'll give a couple examples of how to ask for pronouns um, and respect pronouns uh, as we continue on. Um, but this is just something really important to understand. Um, and part of the reason why we always ask people um, to put their name um, and pronouns in their Zoom name um, at the beginning of our meetings, because we don't always know just based off of looking at someone because their gender identity is different than their gender expression. And it's always best to go neutral than to assume what someone's gender identity is. Um, so touching on pronouns in general, we're going to go really briefly into neo pronouns. Uh, so these are pronouns outside of the binary or uh, non binary pronouns that we usually see. Uh, so she, her, um, he, him, and they, them are considered uh, kind of the base pronouns in general. Neo pronouns are either created um, or are a way to get out of that considered binary. Um, it's usually tied to neurodivergence as well um, and how gender is viewed. Uh, a lot of neuro neurodivergent people um, have trouble, uh, trouble like grasping what gender is because it is a, uh, it's a social construct. So because of that, uh, neo pronouns are a great way uh, to kind of break away from uh, the stigma or maybe not the stigma, but the um, binary that is gender um, and that overall perceived social norm. Non-binary people uh, can feel like non-binary is a box um, because it's used so often, um, or it's only one of three options that they have, for example, um, when they're filling out a form. Uh, so neo-pronouns can be a way to continue to escape that binary. Um, and just a note that documented neo-pronouns go back as early as the 1780s. So these are not new. Um, it might be the first time some of you have heard about them. Um, but again, just documented ones go back uh, that far or, or that early, I guess, as Derek corrected me earlier. Um, but that also means that there are other cultures who have had neo-pronouns um, way before these documented events. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that neo pronouns came uh, to, to light in the 1780s. Um, it just means that that's when we have it written down. And there are many different neo pronouns and more being created, um, but just some of the ones I'm going to go over are well known or most used. Um, and always defer to the person uh, who's explaining their pronouns um, and respect their wishes. Um, again, I'm not an expert on this. So we have uh, they, them, theirs uh, pronouns, or I believe they, them, theirs. Uh, there are a couple different pronunciations of this. Um, that's up on the top. We have uh, e, m, ears pronouns um, right in the middle, and then there's uh, fay, fair, fairs. Um, all of these. <laughs> Pronunciation is up to the person who is using them. I had probably butchered at least the first one, um, but just be respectful um, and use pronouns um, as the person who identifies with them wishes. Next slide, please. I'm gonna pass it over to you, Nick. Awesome, thank you so much. Super comprehensive. Um, yeah, so this kind of uh, illustrates both the intersections of me being um, Filipino American and also um, I'm talking about being trans and um, my gender identity and gender expression as was so beautifully explained by Maggie. So yeah. Smoking across the street from all the Asian uncles in the neighborhood. Their dreams are my dreams. I watch their young grandkids eyeing my gender from the backyard. Curiosity at my butch pretty, painted nails, self-rolled spliff hanging from a stern frown, bright pink sando with oval sleeveless side boob, dad cap, short shorts. The lolos smoke on their side of the fence, their porch with a folded stroller by the front door. They sit in lawn chairs and trade paternal gossip. They wave back when I greet them. Mutual smoke floating into ancestral sky, smiling because here we are alive another day. I know the titos reminisce about days with straighter spines and tighter skin. I know pride is side by side with aged wonder that they did it, a house full of generations. No recognition needed when you're growing old with everything you hoped. 
Their children's children keep running with laughter and collecting memories in their tiny play baskets. What do I dream of passing on? Um, and I think we have um, time after this for uh, a self-reflection on what you dream of passing on. Um, you know, this is an intergenerational conversation. We're in an intergenerational world. Um, so I'd love y'all to think about what it is that you want to pass on, whether it's tradition, ideals, values, types of love, et cetera. I guess, I guess this is a chatterfall if you don't know what that term means. Um, we're asking this question in the chat, so feel free to put your responses in there. We'll give um, some time for you all to write that out, but we'd love for you guys to reflect on that and share um, what you dream on, of passing on. And please don't hit submit until we ask you to. Uh, the point of a chatterfall is to get all of that out here all at once um, so everyone can see what everyone else is thinking without being influenced by each other's ideas. Um, so we will call that out shortly. All righty, uh, I'm gonna count down uh, from three to one. So three, two, one, please hit submit. Whoa, that's so cool. I've never actually witnessed a Chatterfall, so I was just very excited. And thank you all too, because that is the first one we've ever put together where people didn't actually hit submit before the time was done. Um, so I'm so proud of all of you. <laughs> Good job, everyone. Oh. Can we just, can I read these out loud real quick? Is that cool? A sense of oneness throughout. Thank you, Dawn. A run for my kids to realize that life is short, gender is made up, humanity is weird, and he can reinvent himself every day if he wants to. And I'll always love him just the same. Oh my God, that's so sweet. Okay, I'm gonna pause. I'll read a few other ones out. Um, tolerance and open-mindedness, strength and courage, love, open-heartedness, support, hope, love and respect for all people, as well as animals and plants, passion, understanding, love of family and community and youth, um, breaking barriers, um, to create a nation of unity and acceptance of people as equals, not hate, bigotry, MLK's beloved community will take a struggle to win because there are many haters out there. And hope, tradition, call to action, responsibility, and obligation with a whole lot of love. Um, thank you all for that. There's some other great ones in there too. Feel free to look over that. But since we are running out of time, we need to move on. Thank you, Sid. All righty. Uh, so really quickly, just going over name and pronoun use. Um, so we're going to emphasize the fact that we should normalize asking for uh, a name and pronouns as soon as you first meet someone. So for example, if you say no someone for longer and they tell you that they identify um, as one of the gender identities I've told you about, um, definitely ask what pronouns should I use? If it seems rude to do that to someone who maybe didn't come out to you um, and you don't know very well, one great way when you're first coming up to someone and introducing yourself is just to say, hi, my name is fill in the blank and I use fill in the blank pronouns. How about you? Um, and that's just a great way to start um, off showing that first of all, you're an ally, you understand what pronouns are, you understand how to use them. And then also, um, acknowledging that they have the chance to give it to you um, and tell the, tell you their pronouns uh, without being, uh, I guess, feeling like they're more of a burden by having to take you aside one-on-one -on -one be like, hey, these are my pronouns. Just something to think about. Um, another thing is that quite a lot of people use name tags, um, especially customer service uh, workers, anyone who identifies um, as some sort of genderqueer um, or just is part of the LGBTQI plus community uh, tends to know what pronouns are and will wear little pins. So please respect those pins if you do see them. Um, and then always use a, trend, a transgender person's preferred name. Um, if someone tells you, hey, I'm changing my name to this or I would like you to refer to me as this, um, please respect that. Um, always use preferred pronouns. Um, if you don't know the pronouns, again, uh, you can defer to using they uh, and them. It's an easy way not to misgender anyone until you know them more. And this can be really hard because one of our first kind of um, go-to things is to assume someone's gender identity based on how they look um, or how we perceive them. Um, but again, gender expression and gender identity are not the same thing um, and thus are very important to understand uh, that they are different. And uh, not using preferred pronouns um, 
can be very harmful, especially to people who use uh, gender identities that are outside of the norm. It can feel uh, kind of like you're hitting them with a brick, um, both physically <laughs> and mentally. Um, so it's incredibly important to respect those pronouns um, and do your best to correct yourself um, if you do mess up. Again, you don't have to make a big thing of it. Um, it doesn't have to be um, a huge apology, but just say, I'm sorry, <laughs> move on. Don't make it about you um, and hold yourself accountable. So practice their pronouns um, when you're away from them. Uh, try to do your best to work it into your everyday language um, that you use these preferred pronouns and that you continue to support the people in your life uh, who do go by different pronouns. And then a couple things about etiquette in general. Um, do not refer to transgender people as transgenders or a transgender. Um, refer to them as transgender people. Um, do not refer to transgender people um, as biologically male or biologically female. Um, for example, if uh, there's a transgender woman, uh, refer to her as possibly assigned male at birth. If you absolutely have to talk about <laughs> what sex she was assigned at birth. Um, try to avoid that harmful language um, that, again, makes it seem as though uh, transgender people are not actually valid. Um, so again, biological <laughs> male and biological female is incredibly uh, harmful and please try to avoid that language. And I will put a, a good resource, resource in the chat uh, if you do wanna look up a couple other uh, bits of language that you should try to avoid. Um, but in the meantime, I'm passing it over to Sid. Okay, I'm uh, bringing up a very important topic too. Uh, another trigger warning, uh, talking about some mental health issues and suicide, but this is something that very much affects the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, so definitely just want to bring up that being queer and or transgender is not a mental illness or emotional problem and being LGBTQIA plus does not cause someone to be mentally ill. Rather, social stigmatization and prejudice uh, contribute to health disparities in this population, which can include emotional and psychological distress and harmful coping mechanisms. Um, some stats from a Trevor Project survey, I believe this was from the 2021, they do it every year, um, is 42% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year, including more than half of transgender non-binary youth. 75% of LGBTQ youth reported that they experienced discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity at least once in their lifetime. And affirming transgender non-binary youth by respecting their pronouns and allowing them to change legal documents is associated with lower rates of attempting suicide. Um, these stats were from Trevor Project survey, and they also have many others that follow these same lines. Um, feel free to check out those resources because uh, it definitely illustrates that uh, the role that discrimination can play on especially youth and other members of the community uh, when in regards to mental health. Cool. Um, thank you all. Um, I'm going to close this um, my poem set with uh, this last one kind of about the times that we're in now <laughs> um, with regards to um, COVID and all of the intersecting oppression that's happening right now um, and ageism. So yeah. Um, a house booms with millennial Gen Z laughter in the second COVID winter. I can't tell why I fear food this time, but my homies feed me all day without question. I drive my oldest housemate to work and we sing to music in my car. We talk about family and the holidays, and though it's hard for me to cry, I tear up. I hold my childhood friend's hand while taking wrong turns, driving us to the airport. We weep and grin. Two almost 30 year old Filipino American trans kids embrace before one's flight back to New York and the others drive home. First generation inherits goodbyes. Trust is believing we will see each other again. When I get back, my early 20s housemate rolls as a J and together we figure out how to grow up while everything is ending. A pair of spirits gather to watch the sunset at 3 p.m. and trade secrets. Sweeties comfort me, send nudes, another Tinder match, another bad Lex poem. Night falls onto our gay porch. Steam rises like an apparition from my cup of detox tea. I drag my cig. They cancel each other out. Survivor lives on, post-traumatic. 
every generation inherits an aftermath. So boomers, why call our time inadequate? A tired poet lays in bed, confesses by thumb onto notepad phone screen. Cultural worker meditates on the day, their people, the depth in every passing minute shared, committed to presence where some have to numb. Musician falls in love with every existing voice. Artists can only tell stories they know. I live to write for us all. We came of age as love was changing. Thank you so much, Nick. We're gonna move real quickly into our closing uh, since we are almost at time. Uh, but if you do wanna stay after to ask a couple questions, you are welcome to. But just before uh, we move to that, uh, here are a few calls to actions that we have uh, for you. So promote this webinar series uh, to friends and family. Uh, our recordings of these webinars are going up um, on USL's YouTube, which I will go to next after this. Um, so please check it out. Um, and if you did register for this webinar, which all of you did in order to be here, you will get an email uh, with some of the uh, videos and links. Um, so. Keep an eye out for those, push it out to friends and family. Uh, share what you've learned with the people around you. Uh, try to take something away from this and see how it impacts uh, your overall uh, actions and how you can step up and stand up and help support those in our community. And also hold each other accountable. We're here to, of course, teach you, but that also means that uh, you need to hold each other accountable to what you have learned here today. We, of course, are here to educate, but we're also here to be a part of this community. Um, so hopefully we can see change. Um, and that is the point of these webinars. Um, and yeah, if anyone wants to take a screenshot of this or write some of these down, um, it's pretty straightforward. It's just at whidby.climate for the majority of it. Um, and we're just United Student Leaders on YouTube. But yeah, please connect with us.